will be what can we do with the function once we get it. So the simplest thing, uh, the most most of the time what we do is actually to describe the function. What I mean by this is that, so we have this posterior function constructed. We try to say something about it. For example, the mean, RMS, or what's the most probable point, and so on and so forth. So an example here is, uh, I'm using the counting experiment uh, example again. This time, x was 20, and the likelihood of factors. So then we can report that for this likelihood function, the most probable value is 20, the mean is about 21, the RM is 4.57, and there's also a skewness, it's not symmetric, it's 0.41, and so on, so forth. And uh, this leads us to a very important point here, actually. So the uncertainty is also a description of the function. So the, the big take home, take home message uh, from this session and is that uh, in experimental physics, everything is always a distribution, the likelihood or posterior function. And the numbers we quote are actually just descriptions that char characterize the underlying function. So uh, even if you forget everything else I said, uh, this is the thing that I, I would like everyone to, to remember. So uh, as an example, when we say, uh, some experiment say that uh, we measure something to be 25 plus minus five, uh, what we're actually doing is describing the underlying likelihood function. So for example, it could mean that, uh, for example, most probable value is 25 and uh, 28% most likely interval is 20 to 30. It could also mean that a range 20 to 30 has likelihood value above some threshold. Or it could also mean that the RMS of the distribution is five and so on. Okay, so now let's uh, have a, a short quiz. So here is a mass distribution of the four lepton where you can see there's a Higgs both peaks, peaks here, which looks very nice. Now the question here is that the Y range here, is that a theory parameter of some, some parameter or is it the data? Uh, please press yes or no. Okay, um, I see most people answered no. So actually, uh, the way I would in interpret this is that it's actually uh, more the parameter. So uh, for, for each bin here, well, what we measure is that we see certain number of counts in that mass interval. So for example, it's eight counts here in that mass interval. And then from this eight, we can write out the likelihood function of what the true uh, count of this in this thing should be. And then we try to describe that likelihood function by quoting the uncertainty. So this range here from five to 12 is, is not what we, we, not that we observe five to 12, it's actually that based on what we see in data, we think that the most likely interval of the true count uh, here is in the in here. So I, I hope I make this clear. So the data itself uh, does not really have uncertainty if you don't have the systematic uncertainty, uh, just how many you have. And it is, it is when we try to say something about the true uh, mean a uh, number of counts in that bin, then we have the uncertainty. Okay, uh, let's move on. 
Okay, so rather than describing it, uh, what else can we do? <clears throat> so if we are lucky enough to write down the analytical form of the function, then things are easy. Then we can go crazy with it. We can derive many things. How about what if we have a large number of parameters or if the function evaluation is slow? In this case, uh, we can build the function numerically. And uh, I'll give an example from the Higgs analysis. So for example, if you want to measure the Higgs thin CP poverty, then we have a lot of parameters to, to go in. We have the mass, the, sh the width, and all the anomalous coplings that we want to get to. And there is a CMS uh, has a MD method in full lepton analysis. So in this method, uh, in this analysis, we have four leptons, each have three momentum. So we have 12 observables. And we have more than 10 parameters in here. And th this analysis, what uh, it does is that it tries to write down the full likelihood of these 12 dimensions. And what this means is that for each point in the likelihood, we have to do a 12 dimensional integral. And we have to evaluate a few 12 by 12 Jacobians for parameter change and so on, because the integral is not in that frame. And in the end, it turned end up to be about one second per evaluation. Now it doesn't seem that bad because it's one second. Uh, however, uh, if you want to fit for this thing, uh, the fit can easily take 100 or 1,000 steps. And then you want to derive the uncertainty from this, then it be quickly becomes uh, computationally very expensive. And there are many ways we can go for this. And one potential way uh, that we adapt in the statistical analysis here in Jetscape is we create a separate samples that distributes according to the posterior function that we have. So in other words, uh, uh, on the left-hand side here, we see that there's this, this function, uh, the likelihood function. And what we do is that we create a large set of numbers. So for example, first few are here and so on and so forth, like a million numbers. And if we take these numbers and plot a histogram, it gives us back the function. So if we are able to do this, then we can just analyze the samples because this is just a collection of numbers. Uh, we can derive things very easily and without having to worry about the caustic calculations on the left-hand side, where each point can take uh, one second in the previous case or even longer in many other cases. Okay, and how do you do the sampling? Uh, the conceptually most simplest way is to basically shoot darts. So we have this uh, diagram, uh, this, this curve. We print it out, put it on, this, on the wall, and we shoot darts randomly. And then some will land outside the ring, uh, above the curve, some will land uh, below the curve. And then we collect everything that's below the curve, and that's our sample. And I think it's easy to convince yourself that the samples will distribute according to the height of the curve. So this knife uh, one will work. However, it's not necessarily efficient because you see there are all the waste in calculation above here for the ones that's not accepted. So there are ma also many variants of this kind of dot shooting. Uh, for example, in, in Reiner's uh, lecture, he, he talked about some of them, uh, for example, important, important sampling, where you exclude some parts of the phase space where you don't shoot things, and so on and so forth. Uh, there are many variants of this to improve the efficiency. And uh, in the status, statistical analysis here, we use what's called the uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. And it's, it sounds fancy, but it's basically, it's just another way to achieve the same thing. In other words, it's, 
uh, it can shoot darts more, much more smart, smarter than, than us. And uh, practically what it does is that it has a chain of samples. So it goes through the phase space with some special algorithm. So it picks a point in the parameter space and then it tried to go uh, follow some algorithm to go pick out the next point. And then from the next point, it pick out the even next one and so on and so forth. And as emphatically, uh, this set of samples will approach the desired distribution that we want. And for a bit of, a bit of jargon, we call this collection of, of samples a chain. And it's basically just a chain of samples. Okay, and um, to make things more concrete, I will talk a bit about the so-called metropolis algorithm, which is uh, one of the, uh, which is a, a simple version of it. <clears throat> so the, the algorithm itself is very simple. So for example, you have already a chain of uh, samples and the last one is here, theta i. Then for each step, you pick a proposed location to move to randomly. So this is proposed, we propose to go here. And then we evaluate the likelihood of the original point and the proposed point. And it goes as follows. If the likelihood is, if it's more likely at the proposed point, we, we go there. If the likelihood of the proposed point is lower than where we you are right now, we throw a dice to de determine if we go or not. And that's it, basically. So this is uh, the, the gist of the algorithm. And even though it's, it's very simple, uh, it's, it, it can be proven that this will approach the, the desired uh, posterior distribution in the end. So this, and this version actually already works reasonably well already. And it's, yeah, it's, it's very simple. And it, to me, it seems like it's black magic, but it's, yeah. So uh, one direct consequence of this is that if you look at the list of samples uh, and look at the neighbor points, uh, because the, the outcome of each step can be you go to next step or you stay at the same place. So that means that if you are staying in a place where it's very likely, it's possible that you will stay in the same uh, place for multiple samples. And therefore the samples are very correlated from one to, to the next, next one. And the other consequences uh, will lead to what we call the burn-in effect. So the MCMC will only approach the desired distribution as asymptotically, meaning that if we let it uh, uh, iterate and go for a very long time, eventually the samples will approach what we want. And this also means that the initial state, initial steps do not necessarily follow our desired distribution. So for example, if your posterior distribution is, has a two-peak structure, uh, initially, if you, you will start from one of the peaks and you will stay there for a long time. And if you don't wait long enough for the chain to move to the next peak, then all your samples will be on one side and that is not what we want. So uh, a schematic view here is, uh, plotted here. So y axis is the theta i, the sample location. X axis is the steps. So it goes step by step, you just plot it out. And what we will see is something like this. In the beginning, you will be somewhere far away and going randomly. But eventually, after some time, it will follow the, the true distribution around some value. Okay. So let me recap a little bit about this part of the lecture. So once we have built the posterior function, then we can proceed to analyze it. 
And what we can do is we can quote numbers to describe the function. And let me repeat the, the important message here. The numbers we quote in experimental physics at least are descriptions of the likelihood of what we think the true value should look like. And in case the, the thing is not analytical, we can also create samples and analyze them statistically. To do this, we can throw darts or we can run MCMC and so on and so forth. There are many other choices as well. Okay, uh, let's pause a little bit and see if we have any questions, so outstanding questions on Slack. So Yi, there was one uh, question from Dan that I think probability density function. And there's, there's, a, there's a nice reply uh, from Isaac on Stack Exchange that explains the difference, but I think, uh, I think it would also be helpful for you to address it. Yes, so uh, the short answer is no, not always. So as you know, the, the function basically is just a mapping. You have some x, you map it into y. And the likelihood function itself is just a mapping of how likely each parameter is. So talking about, uh, so it's not the probability density function, uh, not necessarily. And that's actually the main difference between the likelihood and the posterior probability. Because the posterior probability function is a probability density function. And then it makes sense to talk about the like sampling from it and doing things that it's cool, which in likelihood, it's, it's a great idea. Okay. Um, if there's nothing else, I will move on. Okay, let's move on for now. We can always come back. 